souls and humans. Much of what we're going to talk about tonight is going to come from Kabbalah, Hasidut, and Zohar. The reason being because those Zohar, which is a part of Kabbalah, Chassidut, which is a byproduct of Kabbalah, which is basically Kabbalah stretched out, um, explained, elucidated, is what? It's a piece of work that wasn't written so that we could understand angels, demons, and everything else. It was basically written so that those who could decode it can actually improve life in this world, improve life for themselves, and most importantly, find the true purpose of, of existence. So wherever Kabbalah is going to discuss demons, wherever Kabbalah is going to discuss angels, wherever Kabbalah is going to discuss anything, it's always to come and understand the functioning of this world which leads us to the purpose of this world, the purpose of creation, the purpose of mankind being created. So we're actually going to have to say that our souls and humans, primarily souls, well, where else would you go? You don't see souls being discussed in depth in um, the Torah. The Torah does talk about souls leaving people. They died. Um, we, 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 in the Torah, we've got this idea of the kiss of God, um, which is where... Um, Hashem literally um, is the one that harvests the soul from a person. Very, very, very rare. Usually that is done by the Malach Amovis, the angel of death, who is not really a grim reaper sort of sculled figure with a black hood and a sickle. Um, think of him more as someone with a halo and angels just doing his thing. Yeah, halo and wings. Suddenly death becomes a lot less morbid and a lot more spirit. Wow, I'm going to go with the angel with a halo. I'm not going with... <laughs> Yeah. Well, who do you want to go with? So, you know, it gives you a lot more to look forward to. It kind of opens you up like, well, take me. When I was a child, there was, um, there was a song, and I suppose I look at death through this song. It was written by a Hasidic pop singer. I know, Hasidic pop singer. Um, in my world, that's normal. Um, Hasidic pop singer is basically a person who sings um, um, Jewish music. Is usually, um, when I grew up, most of them were Hasidic. A lot of the popular ones, they actually were from different Hasidic groups. And a lot of what they sing about are either verses um, from prayer or from the Torah or different ideas on getting along. It's not so much like gospel. It's not... This sort of stuff. It's it's a bit more, it, it, you know, it's a, it's pop because it does use, use you know, um, modern influence. But the themes are very interesting. And one song um, is about the life of a soul. And it starts off with whoever the narrative is about saying, come with me, my little Neshomala. So it's this baby soul. And, and, and it's basically the angel carrying the soul and the soul not wanting to go with this angel because it's such a bad place down there. It looks cold and lonely. Um, and the soul's explaining, no, it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to take you to a wonderful place. And basically dumps him in this home. Dump is, is not really a word using that song. And you'll be born into this home. And, and the angel says, well, maybe I could go there. They look like there's light. There's Torah. There's, there's positive attitude in the home. And then there's this musical riff, which is obviously the life of the soul. And then it starts off with the same words, come with me, little Neshamala, but this time the angel has come to take the soul back and the soul says, no, I don't want to go. Leave me here. I'm enjoying this. And the angel says, yeah, but your place is up there. And the, angel sa and the, and the soul says, but there's so much more work down here. Promise me that I'm going to go to the highest of the highest area. And the angel says, yes, I promise you. And at that point, they go together back upstairs. So to, based on such a song, which was just, you know, just a nice musical thing. It was only later when I started thinking about what the words are actually about. It actually makes birth and death an extremely exciting thing for the inner me. And that the soul does, isn't afraid of death. The soul just doesn't want to die because it knows full well there is so much more that it can do down here. So we're going to have to analyze this soul and then we can get on to the human and whether the two are actually separate. So what is a soul? So I'm going to start off with some classic stuff. You may have heard it here before. You may have learnt it elsewhere. But the five parts of a soul are nefesh, ruach, neshama, chai, yechida. Now, I've actually, now that I look at it, um, someone obviously didn't edit this very well because yechida is really the highest and nefesh is the lowest. So if you reverse the order, and I've put this picture of an extension cord because that's really what the, the soul is. 
The soul is made up of five different stages. Much like the extension cord has a head, it has another head, but one plugs in to receive, uh, to, to take on energy from the power source, and the other one is to plug in to be able to benef uh, provide to whatever it is that it's being plugged into, whatever um, the appliance is. And then we've got coils and coils and coils, which is what bridges from here to there. So Yechida is what plugs into the socket. And nefesh is the bottom of what, whatever it is that you're plugging in. So let's say the video camera would plug into nefesh, and you'd plug this part, that's yechida. That's where, it, and just to translate it, nefesh ruch neshama chai means soul, 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 soul. And yechida means soul. Um, <laughs> that's why we use the Hebrew, because it gets lost in translation. But if I had to try, yechida, which is the most important part, means is from the Hebrew word yachid, which means singular. It's at that point where the soul is one. In a conscious state, on the soul's level, it is one with the Creator. And so therefore, when we say, um, um, that, that the soul is a part of God, mamash, literally, it is a part of God, we're not saying allegorically, oh, respect everyone because we're all the cut of the same cloth. We're saying respect because the energy, the vitality of this body, as everybody in this, in this room is, is a chelak elokah, is a part of God, is a part of the Creator. It isn't an, an extension of, it's, uh, well, it is, but it isn't a separate entity. It is plugged in, which means it is one with the Creator. And all we're seeing down here in the room is something closer to this end, where Yechida is an out-of-body part of the soul. It cannot be contained in a body. It's plugged up there, so it can't be down here. Chai is a photosynthesis style element of soul. It's um, around us. Chai means life, right? We, we give $18 to charity because that's the numerical value of Chai, Yudchet. Um, chai is just a very popular word. Chai is the source of two Hebrew names, Chaya, which is a girl's name, which means life, or Chaim, which is a boy's name, which means life. So Chai is life, but it's not within the body. It is the external energy that allows the body to exist from a sova, from an outer point of view. Neshama is the part of the soul that allows me to have intellectual ability. Um, whether someone is uh, mentally challenged or not does not come into this. Everyone has a neshama. Everyone has an element of soul that allows them to have intellectual ability. Whether their brain functions at full capacity is a completely separate part of uh, the bot of of the whole spiritual system. It's 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 completely physical. It does not make a difference to the soul for the sake of this current discussion. We'll, we'll, although we'll change that a little later. And neshama is from a similar word neshima, which means breath, which means that where does breath take place <sighs> of course it's in your lungs but it begins up here with your nose and mouth and therefore neshama is within your head where your breathing apparatus is ruach is your spirit what is spirit spirit is your energy what is your energy it's your it's it's where all the feelings come from when someone hurts you where do you feel the pain right here when you feel excited where do you feel the excitement right here when you're nervous where do you feel the nervousness right here it's just below but it's all part of that feeling um, stuff we call that the lev it's the heart it's not really that your heart generates feelings but rather you feel it right where your heart is so therefore ruach is an internal part it is what allows you to feel it is what allows you to have energy and then nefesh Bang up soul. Nefesh, kibadam hua nefesh, because in the blood is where you'll find the soul. Nefesh is the part of soul that allows us to exist. It allows us to operate. It allows us to just be as a human. And where can you find it? In our blood. So wherever the blood can flow is where the nefesh is. Someone, God forbid, has to have a limb removed. The blood no longer flows. Therefore, there is no soul flowing into that limb. Therefore, the limb must be buried. You do a kidney transplant, whose blood is making that kidney function? The new person, therefore it is their kidney. So you can actually draw a lot of interesting distinctions just from understanding these five levels of soul. So that's what a soul is. A soul is that which allows something to exist. The soul is the animator. It is the provider. It is the receiver of raw energy. It allows the energy to be processed all the way to being able to move. Suddenly, every movement 
is so exciting because this isn't just, oh yeah, there's some message from my brain to, through my nervous system that allows me to move faster than I can even think about the concept that I'm thinking about. It's actually that every time I move is an animation of soul. So soul is what allows us to exist. But get this, the soul isn't only um, what allows us to exist, it, the soul is what allows everything to exist. Everything has a soul. Not necessarily um, complex like this, but everything has a soul, which means animals have some sort of spiritual energy that allow them to exist. We call that a soul. Um, plants have some sort of soul, and rock, sand, earth, inanimate objects also have a soul. The fact that they exist means that they must have some core spiritual form that's allowing them to exist. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're animated. So they may not have um, ruach because they're not animated. So they operate in different ways. And we often don't even call these nish, n uh, uh, nishamot. We don't call them souls. They're called more nitzutzot. And nitzutz is a spark. A spark is something that provides life. A spark is something that can start a fire. But a nitzutz is hardly the power of the soul type that we need. It is a spark that allows it to exist, but it's not enough to animate it and get it speaking and talking. So we don't hear rocks breathing, speaking or talking. In fact, they don't breathe, speak or talk, but that doesn't mean rocks don't communicate. They may not communicate in ways that people can relate to or even any other aspect of nature, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a song. It doesn't mean they don't have a spiritual vibration, which plays a crucial role in the world. So everything has a soul. But we have to ask that question, does everyone have a soul? Now, the projector's not giving you a Saddam, but I think you can definitely work out um, this is Hitler, um, don't want to be too political, but if you want to know more about him, you can listen to Triple J Radio. Um, this is Saddam Hussein. Oh my God, I'm going to get sued. Um, Saddam Hussein, um, who also is no longer um, living. And then in the middle is some model who's modeling a pharaoh outfit, but it portrays exactly what I want to give off, and that's pharaoh. The reason why I'm putting pharaoh in there is that that's a bit of a mean deal. I mean, pharaoh is a biblical character. Obviously, the Torah felt him worthy of mention. Why, why put him in their bracket? Because Pharaoh is what's going to spark my next discussion. This is for everyone else to discuss. I go into any high school, and I don't mean to be patronizing in case you were going to ask this, but I go into any high school and I'll talk about souls. And, and actually, I, I was in a Catholic school a couple months ago. There are a couple Catholic schools here that I go to. And um, so there's one girl. Oh, she's so... <laughs> it was so beautiful to hear this. She goes, because I was basically the first Jew she ever met. She's in year 12. Um, <laughs> I, I really spooked her. She goes, um, I see you, but I also see Jews who uh, have like longer <laughs> side curls and they wear longer black coats. And I go, um, do you live like in Ripon Lee or Elwood? She goes, how do you know? So I go, ah! ah, she's like getting all nervous. I said, yeah, do you drive like up Hotham Street area? She goes, yeah, yeah. She's getting all nervous. I said, that's where they live. Um, <laughs> so she wanted to know. So, so she says, look, uh, another girl says, that was her question. Another girl says, look, I, I don't want this to sound offensive, but what about Hitler? I said, I'm not offended. It's actually a really, really good question. And the answer is yes, Hitler must have had some sort of energy force to allow him to exist. Otherwise, he wouldn't have existed. If a rock has an energy force that allows it to exist, so too Hitler must have. Now, Hitler couldn't have just had just a basic uh, energy source like a, um, like a uh, rock, because he was a lot more animated than a rock, and therefore he must have had a far more complex soul, some far more complex energy uh, uh, source, which means he also had something that rocks don't have, which is the ability to make a choice. Which means Hitler, as much as we don't like him, is a human being. I know there are, actually, you grow up and, uh, and, and you, you get told the weirdest urban tales, but I grew up always being told by older students, like not anyone of uh, reputation, that, by the way, Hitler never took his boots off. He slept in them. He was a shed. That's it. <laughs> and, that's, and, we just, and there's always at the back of the mind, maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. I don't know. 
I don't know if he slept with him or without his boots, but I'm going to keep him in the realm of humanity because that way we can judge him a lot more severely. If it's a demon, well, obviously he's going to do what he did. Saddam Hussein, like Hitler, um, um, is a human being and uh, therefore he cannot get off the hook for what he's done. He's made a choice and he is an animated person. So yes, they do have some sort of soul. They may not be the same sort of soul as we do, but, but they are the same soul type, as in they're split into five levels. They've got um, an energy force that flies into them. You can maybe say, well, they're from a different barrel. That's possible because um, recently I was in England and I, um, I, just, uh, I was talking to a crowd that had a lot of um, Jews and a lot of other religious types in the crowd. And I was very, very cautious. I didn't want to use the term non-Jew. Because the truth is, there is no such thing as a non-Jew. Because you can't be a non-entity. That would be like saying, I'm a non-dog. You see, I'm a non-dog because I'm a human. Well, I'm not a non-dog, I'm a human. So you can't be a non. A non is a differentiation, but it's not what you are. So you can't say, oh, I'm Jewish and you must be non-Jewish. No. No, that doesn't work because I haven't lay, I haven't given them a, a correct definition. Therefore, um, we can say there are Jewish people, and there are people with other types of souls. Because what makes me Jewish is my soul type. The fact that I have a Jewish mother means that my parents were able to draw on a certain type of soul pool to bring my soul into the world. But that doesn't make me more or less human which means a person who is of a different soul type is exactly that. They are of a different soul type. And there are 60 or 70 other soul types. And, and believe it or not, I can't actually go into all that tonight because we've got so many of our own soul types to explore tonight. We've got seven of our own to explore before we start. And that's within the one called Jewish souls before we can even go anywhere. But I wanted to talk about this guy, Pharaoh. And the reason why I want to talk about him is because I know a lot more about him from a spiritual point of view than I know about the others. I know a lot about Hitler, a lot, because I'm four parts Holocaust survivor. So I know a lot about that. I know a fair amount about Saddam because I'm an avid reader of the news and, and, and uh, Israeli politics and Middle Eastern um, affairs. So I know a fair amount. But I don't know much about the spiritual type. This guy I know very little about. But what I do know is that he lived through the concept of the ten plagues. He enslaved the Jewish people, and he also was the one who the Jewish people ran out on while he, was, uh, while he had the watch. And uh, what's interesting is that the soul comes down into this world, and what differs us, what, ch what, what the difference between us and, um, and angels, let's say, is one fundamental difference. This is the fundamental difference between us and basically any other creation, including animals, believe it or not. Free choice. You'll say, what do you mean, an, an animal doesn't have free choice? Well, no, that would be a little simplistic. On one level they do have choice, on another level they don't. But on the level that they don't is a much lower level than we do. It is almost predictable the way an animal will behave. Almost. We do see that sometimes animals do completely defy, but um, the, 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 the pre-programming of an animal is quite clear. Hungry, go eat. No food, go hunt. Attack or retreat. It's very simple. You attack those who are bigger, you, retreat, you attack those who are smaller, you retreat from those who are bigger, um, proverbially. Um, some animals move in packs, others not. And that's why National Geographic and these sorts of channels can do so well, because they know what's going to happen. They can explain why it's happening. There, of course, there are complexities that we don't understand, because we still don't even understand fully how a hammerhead shark operates, because they've got better laser and uh, better radar systems than some of the finest submarines. But animals, to a degree, from a spiritual point of view, are far more predictable, potentially, than humans. Now, humans are also quite predictable. We know humans attack, we know humans are hungry, they go hunt, but humans have this ability to rise above our nature. Humans are able to, uh, right now Ramadan is almost finished, and I'm using an example of Ramadan because it's far more dramatic than anything we've got. Ramadan is a 40-day fasting period, and we are talking about millions of people on this globe, in this world, 
who just don't eat for 40 days. They eat at night, but I don't care. They don't eat for a whole day times 40. That is not normal. That it's not what we're programmed. We're programmed hunger, go eat. Not hunger, don't eat. Somehow the, we got it wrong in the West and hungry, go eat, not hungry, go eat. That's, <laughs> that's what we do. But, but, but it's not what our nature says. And yet they'll say, no, not hungry right now. Jews, Yom Kippur, Tishrabov, Asar Batevis, Shivas A bit sad, very hungry, not eating. Why? Because mind over body. It's this unbelievable phenomenon of conscious mind over body. And it seems from spiritual writings that animals don't have that conscious ability to completely override their natural system. They will do things, and, and, and quite admirable, this isn't about putting animals down, but humans have this free choice that even if something is crushing them, they will hold on. And we see this idea of Mesira Snefesh. And Mesira Snefesh is not just once in a while. Mesira Snefesh, which means Mesira, is giving over um, Nefesh of the soul. Mysterious nefesh is when a person puts their life on the line for something else. When a, when a, when, not when, I mean, it is mysterious nefesh when a parent takes a bullet for their child and things like that. But we see that people give over their life for their beliefs, for, for, for some sort of educational institution. You know, for, it's unbelievable what people do, and that is actually completely against what we're built to do. I mean, if you think about it, it's almost impossible for a person to hold their own head underwater. It is very difficult to kill yourself. You need something else to help you. So mysterious nefesh is quite, an, uh, quite against our pre-programming, and yet we're able to do it. So that's what our soul, how angels, on the other hand, not at all. On the great godly computer, God was typing, Angel Michael, there was a default. There is nothing that could go wrong. Angel Michael go, Angel Michael goes. Angel Michael come back, Angel Michael comes back. Angel Gabriel heal, he goes and heals. Angel, uh, Raphael, Raphael come back, he comes back. God says people believe, they go, hmm? God says the world's this old, hmm? God says don't, the people say what? In fact, now God says we don't even listen. So <laughs> that, that's my little... Um, that's my little, uh, like, uh, American TV. We don't listen to the Lord. Um, but <laughs> that's my little gospel for the day. But, uh, but we don't have to listen. We don't have to. Hashem could say whatever Hashem wants to say. We have the choice whether or not we're buying in. If you think about it, we have 100% choice. If we don't do anything this Saturday, guess what will happen to us? Nothing. If we do something this Saturday, guess what's going to happen? Not much. <laughs> so, so, oh, we could get stoned. Of course, on a spiritual realm, that's not entirely true at all. But in our life, there'll be byproducts. Keep Shabbos and be with the family, and there are all these beautiful byproducts. But that's not what Shabbos was given for. It doesn't say, do Shabbos because you're going to have a great time with your kids. Because I can have great time with my kids without doing Shabbos. That's not what the purpose of Shabbos is. There may be beautiful byproducts, but if you did the same thing as what you do on a Saturday, on a Sunday, or a, or a Wednesday, you'll probably, if you go with your kid on a Wednesday night to shul, and on Thursday morning you have a big meal together, and then you go and play in the park, and you don't turn on your phones, and you don't drive cars, you'll probably end up having just as good a family life as if you did it on Shabbos. This isn't to put anyone down. I'm purely coming from a spiritual point of view of where we have this choice, and we choose to do it on Saturday, often because of a higher belief, others because there is a higher feeling. Now that feeling is not, some people call it guilt. I don't call it guilt. Unless it's motivated by guilt, I don't call it guilt. Some people just get a feeling and people go, yeah, that's still a little bit of guilt. No, it's not. Two Yiddish words, the pintle yid. The pintle, pintle means that little point, that little dot. The yid is the Jew. The, inside us, there is a soul and that soul burns. That soul is a nefesh ruach neshama. It is, it, is, it is alive, as we're going to discover, and therefore it somehow manages to communicate with this thing that we call a body. And so therefore, sometimes when we just get this gut weird feeling to do something spiritual, it's not guilt. It's the soul managing to find a way of consciously communicate with the mind, something that the soul and mind struggle to do most of the time amongst most people. One of the greatest things is to be able to become um, transparent with your soul and be able to not hear the voice, but just 
when, when, you're, when you're totally one with your soul, and you totally understand what the soul's about and what the soul's doing for the body, you don't hear voices. If you hear voices, I don't know what you're hearing. It's not your soul. Uh, I don't want to say anything offensive because once I did and someone said, hey, I hear voices. It's like, oh, well, did I say voice? I didn't mean voices. Is it delayed? No. So if you hear voices, whatever. But, but when you are in tune, it's so much deeper. It's instinct. Instinct. You know, like it's instinct for a person to stub their toe and swear. Some people have the instinct to not swear. It gets you so deep that when you're in tune with your soul, that automatically you just respond. I'll tell you a quick story, just a quick segue. I think it was with the Reb Marash, or maybe the Reb Rashab, I can't remember. Um, this is back in the old country in Russia. He went um, to a big gathering of rabbis, and they were going to sit down and eat, and he went to wash his hands. Now, the normal way to wash your hands for bread is two spills on the right, two spills on the left. If you're left-handed, two spills on the left, two spills on the right. That is the correct way to wash your hands. He washed three times. Now, there is a Zohar that says you wash three times, but that's not what Jewish law says. Some people do that. Most Jews around the world actually do two on each hand. And so they asked him, so the guy obviously behind him asked him, like, why do you wash three times? So after he had bread, he said, I can't tell you the source right now, but the fact that my body doesn't means it's right. He wasn't being obnoxious. He's in a room filled with other very, very great rabbis. But he's saying, I've trained my body and I'm so in tune with my soul. He was an extremely spiritual person that if I'm physically doing it, it's because I'm in sync. This is, that's the level of master. That's master. So that's quite unbelievable. Pharaoh, let's just come back to our picture here. He... Um, he what? He enslaved the Jews. Moses comes and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. He, um, God says, um, hit the Nile, we'll turn it to blood. No worries, turns it to blood. And then frogs, and then lice. And then what does the Torah say? The Torah says that Hashem said to Moshe, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Which means, did God take away free choice from the man in the middle? Was he putting him through some sort of torturous state? Because that's not very fair. You want to torture him, torture him. But don't force him into torture. What if he really wanted to? And from here we see that Pharaoh must have had free choice because he is a bearer of a soul. And a soul allows you to have that free choice because it defines you to be human if you have a human soul. And therefore, all that happened in that story was what happens to us all the time. The only difference between us and Pharaoh is Pharaoh was an extremely spiritual person. Pharaoh was like this. He was like, his eyes are open. We're not that spiritual, as in Pharaoh consciously all day was aware of spirituality. He had a pay, uh, um, an Egyptian uh, spiritual system. He was very much a part of that. The ancient Egyptians were extremely spiritual. And when we say spiritual, we don't mean people like us. They're like, they weren't druids in modern day England running around the trees um, hoping to get some sort of spirit. These are people who really manipulated the spiritual systems. They were doing magic and all sorts. What happened was, the way things were presented to Pharaoh was so convincing that he could actually outdo God. It's a bit like us. You know the phrase, throwing good money after bad? Where does that come from? It comes from this human tendency and behavior to not want to let go, even though the writing is on the wall to let go. And more often than not, most of us actually don't let go when it's right, and we keep investing in something because we know it's going to get better. We don't know anything. We've convinced ourselves, and we're trying to convince everyone else because either out of pride or some false sense of surety that it's going to be better, and therefore people throw money. And you're just watching, you go, this guy's a dumb cop. He's just going to blow all his money. And yet they do it. It's a bit like like the people who win the lottery. Most people lose their money because it's, they throw good money after bad. Or, or people who, who are investing completely the wrong way, whatever their energies or efforts are. So Pharaoh was constantly just investing good money after bad. He thought, no, 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 the way I see the facts, because what Hashem did was he presented the facts to Pharaoh in a way that he'd be convinced that he can, this time he's got it. Because how many times do we see people make the same mistake, not once, but five, ten times in life? 
we, we see it, we see it um, um, in, in, in every aspect of life, from relationships to communication to finances to spirituality, that we, ju- that we just see. And we see it in ourselves. How many times have you made the same mistake multiple times? No, this time was different. This time was different. Well, that's what Pharaoh did ten times until eventually he said, well, the firstborns, you know, that looks pretty, that looks pretty clear to me. Off you go because I'm a firstborn and my boys are firstborn and we're a bit nervous about this no matter how good the stats look. And then the next day, what does he say? No, 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 changed my mind and that's when he started chasing the Jewish people. So the soul... The bearer of the human soul gets this thing called free choice. And that's what differs us from everything that was discussed last week. Where demons are pre-programmed on a deeper DNA level to rebel. And that's because they're out, they come out of a system of rebellion where they don't feel attached. And therefore it is impossible for a demon to ever come good. A demon will always remain bad. An angel will always remain positive. A person can be good. A person can be bad, and a person who is bad can become good, and a person who is good can become bad. That's unbelievable. A person who is bad can become good. doesn't mean we have to forgive him. So I'm going to say something really outlandish. Let's say Hitler didn't commit suicide. Let's say. And let's say he did tshuva. I don't think there is tshuva. I don't think he could um, spiritually recover for what he did, but it's not for me to judge. But let's say he did. That doesn't mean anyone has to forgive him. Forgiveness doesn't mean you've repented. Repent means you've done your own spiritual soul searching and you've changed and maybe upstairs they might look at you differently. But that doesn't mean down here we look at him differently. So it is possible in theory for a person who is a bear of a soul who has done unbelievable crime to, to, to turn it around. The Talmud lists a, a few people. Truth is Hitler probably would have fallen into because he did things that were worse than others. But in theory, a bad person could do could become good on a spiritual level, but that doesn't change the facts down here. That's why in the Jewish legal system, we have capital punishment. So even if the murderer says, no, 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 after the murderer has been found guilty and the murderer has been proven that the murderer, that the murderer did the murder and, and, and that the murderer is exactly the person who we want to be prosecuting and the murderer is the murderer is the murderer, and then they say, right, you're going to hang or you're, you're going to be stoned or whatever it is. He says, no, 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 I repent, I repent. The high court says, of course you repent. We want you to repent because we want your soul to go upstairs a little better, but that's not our issue. Let God worry about your repentance. We have to deal with society and you're a threat to society you're a criminal who has broken a fundamental law of society the punishment is the death penalty so the soul bearers I just chose bad ones obviously good guys have soul and good gals have souls so I didn't need to put pictures up there the seven types of soul now this is only within Judaism this is only within Judaism although these core principles will be found in other types of soul systems as well now I'm going to get my folder out at this point because there's a lot more to this slide than I'm letting on. And it's not that I didn't want you to know it, but it was impossible for me to get through all this material. So just one sec. Okay. Chesed. Seven types of souls based on the seven emotional sfirot. We know there are ten sfirot. Three of them are intel, uh, based around intellect, chokhmah bin Adas, and the bo- bottom seven are all emotions. And the emotions, and this is the process in which Hashem created the world, it's the process in which everything operates. Everything begins with a chokhmah, a spark, just the spark, standing in the shower, just mind your own business, and some of you have heard me talk about this. Stay in the shower, money, all business, all done. Bing! You got this idea, and you start smiling, and you got this idea, and people just walk out of the bathroom, people wondering what happened in there, and you smile and say, Why are you smiling? You go, I can't explain. You're going through this process of binna, development of your idea. Das, the conclusion of your idea, you've got it down pat, and then you begin the emotions of how it's going to be colored in, and how you're going to build bricks, but Gavura, not too many bricks, and the emotions and the effort that's going to be put in. That's how I should created and that's how our thought processes are if you think before every time you move someone hurts your feelings you quickly do this quick <sighs> person hurt my feelings I feel bad inside the way to defend myself is by overpowering them right chesed here we go not much chesed there not much kindness there strength to gvura right wind up with my punch balance myself and malchus deliver boom 
We do it. It's ten sefirot. Um, um, person gives you a kiss on the cheek. Chochma, they love me. Bina, they love me a lot. Das, right, give them a hug. That's the right way. Chesed, open up. Gvura, not too tight. Not too tight now. Tferes, uh, balance. Netzach, hod yasod, bit of a shockle. Malchus, deliver. So we do this all the time. These are the ten sefirot that dictate our life, which is why so much of Chassidut is dedicated to explaining the ten sefirot and understanding. And it happens over and over again. Guess what happens after Malchus? A further chesed. It's a further development of the whole thought and feeling. So all souls seem to come from a um, from the seven emotions that were involved in creation. So chesed. Chesed is kindness. It is a soul whose service of Hashem is characterized by a calm and flowing love. Now this isn't some, um, I'm not doing horoscopes here in the newspaper where, you know, oh, that's me, that's me. This isn't some, these are very, very general. Um, the truth is these come with combinations of another seven. So it's actually seven by seven, which is 49. And then it comes with a further 49 multiplied. So really souls are much more complex, but these are the parent types um, character, uh, characteristics that we find in souls. A soul whose service of God is characterized by the calm and flowing love. This soul is also overflowing with love for the fellow. So if someone is pure chesed, and we don't have too many people who are pure chesed. Very, very few people are pure chesed. Avraham, Abraham is, is, is the embodiment of a soul which is pure chesed. There was nothing else. What do we see? Um, all he wants to do is entertain people. He just wants guests. I just circumcised myself. Hey, have you had a meal today? Because th don't worry about me. I'd love to feed you. That's chesed. Chesed is just like, like this. No worries. So... And there are a few people, very few people are raw chesed. Anyone that is an extreme of any of these is a very, very rare person. There are the occasional person, the occasional great person who just goes out and helps society. Not like for a few days in a month. I'm talking about every day of the month, every month of the year. Why don't you take a holiday? They're like, why would I take a holiday? You take a holiday from things you don't like. I love this. In fact, I'm going to Africa next week, and, and, and in 10 years, I'm going to be moving to, to, to Southeast Asia. And when I'm 85, and you see these people, they're 85, 90, and until they actually, God forbid, get dementia or, or something else knocks them over, they're like going, going. Very, very few people like that. I suppose in, in Christianity, some of the, those people would go on to become saints, because it's so rare. That's generally how religions prop these people up because they say, well, that's an extremely rare thing. But that's, that's a person whose soul type is chesed. I'm not saying that um, every saint is a, is a Baal chesed. I was just using that how we do identify such people. And in fact, so many saints became saints not for things that we as Jews would actually approve of at all. Not, I'm not saying from a religious point of view. I'm talking about from some nasty things that happen over the years. But um, chesed is that giving. It's the Avram Avinu, that person that just gives. Moses wasn't a chesed. Isaac wasn't a chesed. Not every good person's a chesed. Chesed is the person who does this. And this is not challenging. For them, challenging would be to maybe hold back. For them, challenging might be to um, discipline someone. They just give. Give. That's a chesed soul. Gvura. A gvura type of soul um, Gvur means severity, is a person, and, and I'm, I'm bringing it back into how they conduct themselves in context of their, their, their service of Hashem and the way they spiritually carry out their work in this world. A soul who serves Hashem with awe and flaming passion. So don't confuse passion with being passionate about something. Passion over here is the soul is highly disciplined, with high expectations of themselves and others. That passion that motivates them to a point that they expect so much of everyone else. And we don't know a lot of people. We know plenty of people with expectations. But someone who is, I can only think of one person that I know in my life who is that rigid and is not just because they're always rigid. They've worked on themselves to be so rigid they will never step out of line. It has become habit. How rigid they are. The same thing every day. I can tell you where his foot will be at 7.30 in the morning. I know where it will be to the five minutes. His day, every day, is exactly the same thing. He prays at the same times. Um, he, he does everything, and he's a teacher. And he's an unbelievably disciplined, 
uh, achieved individual, but that's Gvura, that restraint to be able to hold back and make sure everything goes, and they're usually very demanding on ev everyone else. I've done it, and I expect that of you. Teferis, harmony, the soul who has achieved a perfect synthesis of kindness and severity. And uh, this, is an ac this is accomplished through the study of Torah. Teferit is also the source of the soul's capacity for compassion. So this is a very balanced individual, and most people say, oh yeah, I'm a bit of Teferis, but Teferis is actually an extreme as well. To be an extremely balanced person 100% of your life. Not that I'm usually balanced. It's not that I've got a lot of this and a lot of that, therefore, on a seesaw, I'm in the middle. Balanced is that every decision they make is a balanced decision. The way they respond to everyone is balanced. They will always respond with the correct response to every situation. E e extremely rare. Netzach is perseverance, is a soul who is constantly battling and struggling and uh, ultimately is triumphant. That's what makes a Netzach soul a Netzach soul. We may all be battlers, but we're not all successful and triumphant. So triumph being successful is what defines the Netzach soul. After the challenge, Hod, which is humility, which is the soul who exemplifies self-abnegation in favor of allowing itself to be overwhelmed by God's goodness. Now, this is not the same as chesed, which is giving. You might say, oh, that was overwhelming. That was wonderful how they gave themselves. Hod is a person who has completely destroyed their ego, but already from moment one on earth, where, where it's not that they're giving of themselves to everyone, but there is none of this ego. There is no gaiva. There is no um, flashy behavior. Um, it's not that they're all about um, recognizing everyone else, but they know their talents. They know their limitations. And at no point will they ever promote themselves unless it's for the good of society. And even then, they won't promote themselves. They'll just put themselves forward for a role. Yesod, which is foundation, is the soul whose unique talent is establishing giving relationships intellectually or otherwise. It's quite a complex <coughs> concept, and I'm not going to go into that because that opens up a massive can. Malchut, which is royalty, which is the soul that serves the creator in a majestic manner. You could almost call this class an elegance, but a person who is naturally elegant. You know, um, um, one of the things that I've discovered um, traveling is you can find people who are extremely poor and have nothing to their name. So they haven't got any fine silver or china to show how elegant they are, but they have such grace such panache, so they, you know, just they are so refined. Even though there's zero education, no finishing school in Switzerland, and yet you can meet very, very wealthy people who've gone to finishing school and everything, and they're so crass. So, so Malchut is that person who is true royalty. What is royalty from a spiritual point of view? Royalty is the epitome of the refined individual. It doesn't mean you bleed blue. It means you carry yourself in, with such dignity. No snottiness, no ego, but dignity. And, and, such, and such grace. That's what Malchut is. So these are seven prototypes. Most people are combinations of these. Some people it's easy to identify whether, whether they're a heavy gvura weighted soul or whether they're a heavy chesed. In fact, uh, it's interesting because a lot of Kabbalistic writings say, so Abraham used to give a lot of charity, big whoop. Big whoop. Easy for him to give charity because that's what his soul demanded of him. Give. He was totally in sync with his soul, so he gave. A big whoop would be if Scrooge gave charity. Because Scrooge's soul is, well, not Scrooge's soul, but Scrooge's tendency, which might be based on something within his soul, which is, or her soul, which is not actually being carried through properly, that that that, that, gvur, that restraint is cha being channeled in a negative way. And then for them to give charity, well, that is an accomplishment. So actually for Abraham, for Abraham to accomplish something, his soul, he had to go through an unbelievable journey because for him to give was easy. He had to be put into a situation where perhaps he would hold back. Perhaps um, things would go against his logic. And taking a life is not an act of chesed. And therefore, for him to be told, go and sacrifice your son Yitzchak, that was like, what? Hmm. My whole life is about uh, preserving and creating and allowing others to have. And you want me to kill my son? You want me to do something that completely counters chesed? And God said, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And then he went and did it. Although he didn't kill his son, he had, well, decided well, that's what he's got to do, which is an unbelievable thing because that completely countered who he was. So that's just an example. So soul types, so 
Forget the, the way we serve God, but if, you f- if a person finds that they know someone who is an extremely gvoradika person, a very, very harsh, um, not harsh with the tongue, but a very strong, disciplined sort of person, believes in others, you could say there's a lot of gvura there. And it's not just emotion, it's coming from a deeper level. Where did one's feelings, remember, nefesh ruach neshama chayechida, which are our emotions, the way we think, they are parts of our soul. So if a person's, Ruach, their spirit, is very into restraint. That's their soul speaking. They, if they're overly restraining and dominating and abusive, that is an element of the soul coming out. That doesn't mean they've got an abusive soul. That means their emotions, they as a body, as we're going to get to soon, are completely out of sync with their soul. But they are channeling energies which come from their soul. A person who is overly giving and in a bad, corrupt way, um, a person who, 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 who will do anything to give charity, therefore they will um, work the black market, they will sell drugs, whatever it takes to help people. Well, there's obviously chesed. This is coming from a very, very special place, but completely messed up because without the refinement of education, without learning what this actually means, we could become extremely misconstrued. So someone could have a malchut soul and become filled with themselves, um, filled with ego, as we see that many of the royals in Jewish history who were malchut, they were true malchut, they were born, their soul was brought down from a certain place, and yet they were power-hungry mongrels who actually uh, raped their own people. So, so having the soul means nothing. It's knowing what to do with the soul. So let's talk a bit about the body. We know now quite a bit about souls. Souls allow us to have free choice. Souls define our characteristics. Now let's um, talk about body because once we start talk about expressing our characteristics, we're basically already talking about the body because the soul doesn't express. Souls don't speak. Souls don't feel. Souls don't think. They're above all that. Souls cause these things to happen. Our body. Uh, is a receptacle for these things. And this is where it's so challenging for us to realize that we are actually two bodies in one. There is me, and then there is me. And I am two different things, but I am one. And that is me. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw a little uh, unholy trinity into this. There is a trinity... Um, in Judaism, but it's not at all what you're thinking. Satan, who we learned about last week, Satan, which is, again, a character with a yellow halo and big white flappy wings. He's just doing his job. He's there to test. He's the divine prosecutor. Um, Satan, the angel of death, remember? Flappy wings, yellow halo, another very positive character, but who kind of gets a bad rap. And then those two are really part of the same entity, and as in they are part of the same spiritual force. And then there's a third part to the spiritual force, the Yetzahara, which is the animal soul, the soul, the part, of the, the part within the body, the life force within the body that says, just do this because that's what humans do. It's not good, it's not bad, it's our animal side, it's our instinct to exist. So when we talk about Nefesh Elokit, Nefesh Bahamas, the, the godly soul and the animal soul, these are not really part of the soul soul. These are extensions of the soul as in it allows the body to function. But the body, what is a body? Look at a dead body. That's a body. What is a live body? There is something complex going on here. And when people have the will to do one thing and the will to do another thing, what is the source of this will? They are our different sides of our subconscious conscience. And that is driven by our soul. Our soul is in the body because the soul can't do jack diddly. Think of it as a ghost, even though we don't really believe in ghosts in that classical form, but it is just a spirit. It is bodiless. It has no legs, it has no arms, it has no eyes, it has no ears, and therefore it can accomplish absolutely nothing. It is just a flame. And, and in last week's meditation, we actually explored this. It is a flame within a bonfire. It does nothing. It's there, but it's part of a bonfire. So a soul is absolutely nothing on its own. It's something, but it's nothing. Put a soul in a body... It's like putting a flame in a lantern. You walk around with that, you've got something magical with you. So the body is a lantern. A lantern without the flame is nothing. So the body is like a chariot. In all Kabbalistic and Hasidic writing, almost always the body is called a Merkava. 
it is a chariot because it allows the soul to travel. The soul is like the horse or the soul is like the wagon driver. Um, without the chariot, it goes nowhere. But the chariot without the driver also goes nowhere. So they are a perfect fit. So the body, the legs, the hands, the, 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 the brain, the thought processes, the feelings, and the emotional process are the way, are the levushim, are the clothing for the soul. Furthermore, our speech, break it up into thoughts, speeches, and actions, sp speech and actions, are the three principal levushim, the garments of the soul. How does the soul actually communicate is only going to be through speech. How does the soul um, allow the Merkava is through thought to think and how is it able to come up with anything is through feeling so these are things that are given via the body, without a body the soul can't do any of that, so there's this so the Levushim are the soul's expressions what the soul is constantly striving to do is get through to our brain to understand and this is where meditation comes in to understand that, hey, body, you're nothing without me. And you going renegade is just hurting me. I'm giving you a life and then you're rejecting me. It's very much, I think most parents will experience this. Thank God my kids are still little and I won't experience it because that's what I'm um, like every other parent that believes that my kids are never going to turn on me. But um, it's like this. I, I, one raises their children, gives them everything. And then 18, the child's like, and it's like, please be home before 11. And the child's like, no way. No way. How many times do I have to slap you, man, before you understand? No way. But I fed you. I gave you. I put a roof over and the roof will still be there. And the child goes, I know. Isn't that amazing? No, I won't be home. So that's what the body and the soul is. The soul is this parent trying to get through to the better part, wisdom of a teenager. And the teenager is like, hmm? Sorry, is there something you're saying? Because I'm not, I'm not hearing you. And, and that's what the, body's, the body is built to not hear the soul consciously. The body is built to try to train to hear the soul. And the soul is built to plug in and it cannot pull itself out almost ever. And even if the body, and we call this, this is a Kabbalistic term, drags the soul through the mud... The soul's got to go with it. That's what happens after death. We talk about heaven and hell, which are not really concepts that, that um, we really discuss too much because life's about here. Um, it's not about the big fiery furnace because I don't think that's what hell is. And heaven isn't just like being fed grapes on a nice Roman couch. I mean, surely we're going to get more than that. In fact, life for, for men, heaven's even more than 70 virgins. It's, it's because, again, it's the same as grapes. It's, it's about being part of the bonfire. And that's not a hell thing. That's a heaven thing. It's about being part of this higher consciousness, this greater awareness, this spirituality of existence of where all this is completely petty and all our fantasies are not even something that the soul ever entertains as being a reward. That's what we entertain as being a reward if we're really crass but that's not what the soul entertains as a reward so the soul if it is dragged through the mud this is what the angel upstairs says so I'll stand behind here so you don't see my feet pretend I'm hovering soul comes up and um, an angel let's say there's an angel let's say there are pearly gates and let's say there's an angel it's not really how it works it's more based in Shomala there's some sort of heavenly court of where God presides whatever that means God doesn't preside anywhere but, and there's no time above this world so we're talking about something that takes place in a realm of time in a realm that time does not even exist and neither does space but let's carry on with our analogy because that's all it is it's an analogy the soul enters the heavenly court and um, there's a there's a discussion. What did the soul achieve in this life? And if the body achieved Jack Diddley from a spiritual point of view, the soul is told, well, you have some communication problems that you need to fix. So we're going to send you to communication school. And the way you're going to go to school is, and that's what Gehenna is, it's not hell, it's not going to burn. What's the point of sticking a pitchfork into a soul? It needs to learn to communicate and then be given another turn to, trans, to, to come down and prove itself. And that's what Gilgal is. Every time the soul doesn't achieve what it's required to achieve, it comes back down. And it goes through a cycle. 
It's all right. It's not bad. It just needs to achieve. It's just like a child. It's like I thought school was a Gilgal. I didn't achieve this year. I've got to go to school again next year. <laughs> so, so that's what it is. We just go, it's just a cycle. And when the soul achieves, it goes, bing, that way, sir. Or ma'am, you've done what you needed to do. Your soul has achieved. So when the body is not in tune with the soul, the soul actually is the one that cops the blame. And so therefore, when the body slaps the, 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 the neshama through the blotter, when the, when, the, when the body drags the soul through the mud, the soul b- burns harder. And that's when you see a person, how often, and, and, and you know, this is the perfect crowd. This is one of the things I love about spirit growth because you don't get this in from circles as much. And because if it does happen, you keep your mouth shut because, I don't know, just, it's, it's like people don't appreciate this as much. Maybe because it's a given, I don't know why. But, you know, you'll be meeting someone and you say, I don't know, they've got, they've got this chook in their head. There's a guy or a girl that did A, B, and C and all of a sudden, they want to go meditate at Spirit Grove. Or they want to go to shul. I, I don't understand this. And I say, I do. Their soul has just fired up and is giving it one last kick in the butt to try to do something. And has managed to communicate where the person says, hang on. Something in me wants more. Often this happens midlife. Something in me wants more. <laughs> no, because if you think that, what is a midlife crisis? A midlife crisis means body has been living according to the body's understanding of life. You're meant to work, you're meant to make money, you're meant to do this, you're meant to raise a family, meant to do, 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 which is all logic. Who said the soul said that's what it's... That, what are, and then it says, hey, you've been alive, you're almost dying, you're halfway there, what are you doing? And the person says, you're right, I've got zero fulfillment. I'm going to start exploring. And then people start going on their journey. And why do people start connecting with Buddhism and other Eastern traditions? Because it's got possible answers to explain questions that they don't necessarily want answered. It's that you're feeling like this. And why is it that Buddhism is so attractive? Is because it is one of those religions or spiritual systems that explores this side. Judaism was always taught as a dogma. But the truth is, Jewish spirituality provides us. And so people at 40 go, no, 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 I'm not going to shul to Daven. I'm not going to meditate because that's a Jewish thing. I'm exploring. And suddenly I'm finding satisfaction. And then you'll get the people that go, I don't know what happened to them. All of a sudden they're doing community work. And not like by going to big parties, giving big money. They're like down there. It's because a person is getting in touch with their soul. And obviously such a person is a very chesed sort of soul. And that chesed wasn't working by just giving money. That chesed need to come and the whole body need to be involved in the give. Or the person suddenly says, I'm stopping. I'm becoming a teacher. Why? Because something in the soul, they're getting in touch. And there are different ways of getting in touch. Very few people ever get consciously in touch where they're basically in sync. But we start getting there. We, as we, and as we start finding fulfillment, that's really the soul starting to burn more steadily and going, this is good, this is good. And then we start refining our mind and our emotions. So these are really what? Who's wearing what? The soul is wearing the emotions and the mind. And if, when it fits... It starts like, it's almost like um, you, you, you do something right, you get a little chocolate. And the more you do right, the more chocolate you get. You just break into this habit of doing, the, of doing the right thing. Because when the soul is restful, the person's feeling rested. When the soul is feeling restless, people are restless. And so all sorts of things that go on in our lives, perhaps, are not because of external things, but rather internal things. Because ultimately, nothing external can affect us unless we let it affect us. So ultimately, satisfaction is not going to come from anyone around us. It comes from somewhere within. And what satisfies one person obviously now makes sense. So this person works for them. It doesn't work for me. Why? We're obviously two different soul types. So no longer do we need to be doing the same thing, which is why we tell people who aren't of Jewish spiritual um, soul system, don't become Jewish. It's pointless. Because... You were made with your spiritual system, with your soul, to do what you do. I, because I, I do community work, that doesn't mean it works for you. And that's why we're in different situations. That's why it's not good for everyone to be the same. It'd be like all women becoming men. It'd be pointless, this world. How are we gonna, how's anything going to get done? Uh, so, so, so body thoughts and feelings are levushim, are garments. So what is this body now? Suddenly when the Tanya, when, the, when Kabbalistic works say, look at your body with scorn. Scorn is such a funny word because it's like, what does that even mean? But look at your body with scorn is, 
not hate thine body and, and slash your wrists and stuff. It's look at your body and say, oh my God, look at this limitation. It's hungry, and when it gets hungry, it stops me from thinking properly. Look at this body. This body, this body um, wants sex, which is obviously something much deeper. We're not talking about just body, but this, this entity wants sex and will do anything to get it. And suddenly, it's not thinking anymore. It's thinking, but not in a soulful way. And so the soul is constantly wrestling. And that's why when it says, look at the body with scorn, because the body is naturally a distracted entity. And on some deeper conscious level, we're trying to conquer that, harness it, and get it back in tune with the soul. And that's why life's a struggle. That's why life, 90%, 95%, again, I make up statistics you can see, but some huge percentage of people have been in him. Battlers, people in the middle. One extreme of the tzaddikim, and trust me, I, I, I can pretty much tell you're not a tzaddik, and I'm not a tzaddik, because do you know what a tzaddik is? It's not that I'm being judgmental. A tzaddik is a person who is born, and from the moment they were born had no will to do anything wrong. No will. I'm not saying they didn't do anything wrong. I'm saying they didn't have the will to do anything wrong. That's why they didn't do anything wrong. Very few people. That sort of person is, has a certain type of soul which is going to achieve nothing in this world. We will all achieve something for ourselves. A tzaddik will not achieve anything in this world. Because the tzaddik's role is not to achieve anything for themselves. Their soul is here to help everyone else achieve. So the tzaddik has no time to be distracted. Has no room to be distracted. Because the power of such a soul immediately harnesses the body. The body knows straight away, I'm under control. I'm like hypnotized for the next 90, 100 years, 80, 40, 60 years, however many years. And can be a male or a female. We have tzaddikus and tzaddik. Tzaddikus is a female um, derivative of the word tzaddik. Tzaddik is a masculine form of the word tzaddik. Both mean righteous individual. And it's not that they're just tzaddikim. You know, we call children tzaddikim. Oh, such a tzaddik. Oh, so it's because children don't do anything wrong. They don't even think about doing things wrong. Where very few children think about killing someone. Uh -huh. <laughs> we think about it. Of course, we never would, but we think about it um, more than once a day. Children, not at all. So that's why children are tzaddikim. But the tzaddik is a person who at age 40 doesn't even feel anything, doesn't, doesn't feel to do anything wrong. So that's why I'm saying no one's a tzaddik, because we'd know, we'd know the tzaddik, unless you're one of the 36 hidden tzaddikim, in which case we'll never know, but you'll still go about doing your thing and you're not even offended by anything. If you've been offended by the fact that I didn't say you're a tzaddik, I promise you now you're not a tzaddik because tzaddikim don't get offended. So there's still any tzaddikim in here. Either way, I'm going to win this. Um, then the other extreme of Rishoyim. You see, Hitler might have fallen into my other extreme, Rishoyim. We can't label Rishoyim. Um, heaven will label Rishoyim. There, there, there are ways of identifying the Russia. The Russia is an extremely bad person who has done so much bad that they have no will. They are the exact opposite of the static. They have no will to do good. They're not Shadim because deep, 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 deep down, the Russia could dig up that will to do good. But they're basically nah, not doing any good. My life is just to deny the existence of spiritual existence and eradicate any possible good that could come from spirituality. That's the Russia. Killing, raping, pillaging, gluttonous behavior is the ultimate behavior of the Russia. Believe it or not, gluttony. So what's so bad about gluttony? I'm not hurting anyone. Yes, you are, because everything is about me. I'm eating, I'm drinking, I'm drunk. I'm enjoying being drunk. I enjoy being full of meat. I have no regard for animals. I have no regard for people. I have no regard for my parents and therefore I take their money to buy my food and wine. That's, that's the ultimate rush. It's the person that uses everyone else to benefit themselves in a way that they will never give back. That's the Russia. And then everyone else in the middle. Some will be closer to the Russia. Some will be closer to the Tzaddik. The person who's closer to the Russia is the person who's struggling, but hardly. Hardly struggling. They're almost enjoying life down here. But every time they go like... Surely there's something more. And then they just like get over that weird feeling and get back into what they're doing. And then everyone in the middle, middle, middle. And then if over here at the tzaddikim, it's the person who basically lives life righteously and sometimes gets a feeling, maybe I should just, maybe I should just think about doing something wrong. And that's already their struggle, that they're thinking about something wrong. They do nothing wrong, but they might think of doing something wrong. And that's the other end. So we're all battlers, and they will never be able to eradicate that will to possibly think about doing something wrong. So they're constantly struggling. So the Bainani 
is is a, a different types of people of how we're all banning him. Hopefully, we're we're battling and we're trying to win the battle. Is trying to conquer this, knowing full well this is unbelievable. We know full well we'll never succeed in conquering it. You'll never become a tzaddik. We'll always be a banani. And yet that's still what we want to do in life. That is what is so special about our soul over every other angel and demon. Because we want something that is impossible and that is what ultimately gives the creator the true nachas. And that's not for tonight. We were just exploring the parallels of the body and the soul. So let's just go one more slide. There's one more slide after this, but this is the last slide. We did this last week. Choices, because that's what life's about. I have a soul. The soul wants to do one thing. Now, let me just quickly talk about the two. The kit, the nefesh Bahamut, the animal soul, the, 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 the godly soul, as it's translated. The animal soul and the godly soul are two sides of the same coin. The, go- the animal soul is exactly that. It's the part of me that makes me behave like an animal. The animal is... is uh, now, you tell pet lovers your animal is evil. Animals aren't evil. They're not bad. Animals just are very predictable. Animal behavior is what allows existence to happen. Hungry? Go eat. No food? Go hunt. You end up living because of such behavior. Want to produce? Go find partner to produce with. Unless you're one of these weird single cell things that you learn about in year eight science, you're an asexual entity. But we don't relate to that because we're humans. So we're not, we're not like that. But, um, you know, we want, go find something. That's animal. Animal doesn't say go rape. That's, that's, that's an extreme part of where I have harnessed weird energies of my soul to take my animal soul to a whole new level. I have made my animal soul an evil thing. I've, I've tended towards the Russia. A person is not born to rape. We have it in us to do that. But, that doesn't, but, the, but we have the exact same in it for us to, to become ultra-extremist, uh, um, spiritual, just below tzaddik as well. So we have the potential to do anything. It depends on what our soul is and, and how we harness it. So we make choices. Life is always about choices, but not just about whether I'm having um, carbs or not having carbs. This is real choice of elakut is what I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to be completely one with my echidah, trying to be completely one with my spiritual existence. I want to be fulfilling the will of the Creator and the purpose of creation. Therefore, down here where I exist, everything has been broken into Kedusha and Tumah. There is actually one grey zone. I didn't put it in because it would have been confusing. It's called Klippas Noga. Kedusha means pure. It's good. It can't be milked and turned into something bad. Tumor is impure. It will always remain impure. And I always choose between the two. But what is it that I'm choosing over? Klippasnoga. Klippasnoga, which I'm not going to literally translate tonight, is basically something that is neither good or bad. Depending on how we use it, we'll define it. And if you think about it, almost everything we come in touch with falls into Klippasnoga. Food is Klippasnoga. You eat your food. You go commit a crime, you've just turned it into Tumor. You eat your food, you do something positive with it, you've just turned it into Kedusha. So our whole life is about taking the neutral and putting it into one of the two sides. So our soul is what allows us to slot it into one of the two. Whether we're in tune with our soul and behaving the way that our soul wants will define whether it gets put into one or the other. Where dogma comes into it, and I suppose this is, this is the only positivity I can find in, in dogma, and uh, to many, Judaism is dogmatic, and it, and it is a dogma, and we do have a dogma, unless, unless you spir- study spirituality, in which case the dogma slowly slips away because you start getting an understanding of these weird rules. The halakha tells the person who, doesn't, who is not in touch with the spiritual realm of discovery, like myself, I can't sit there meditating and gain inspiration and suddenly live my life 100% according to the way the spiritual realms would like me to live my life. I'm just not able to. Therefore, I've opened this book called The Shortcut. And The Shortcut is called The Torah. And the Torah says, do this, don't do that. That's basically, don't study, don't meditate, don't do anything. You want to be putting things in the right box? Here, these are the things that go in this box, these are the things in that box. Now life is about discovering what the two boxes are about and how by doing this or that, I'm putting things in the boxes. 
But everything that we basically come in contact with is usually klipasnoga. Sometimes we come in contact with something bad, it can't be used for something good. For example, um, I don't want to use something that is a little abstract. Um, a gun. A gun is not good, a gun is not bad. You pull the trigger and shoot someone dead, that's bad. Melt the gun down into a bubbling pot of, of metal, turn it into a rake and work the fields, you've done good. So the gun is not a gun, a gun is a collection of metal. What you do with that metal will define it, right? So that's Klippersnoga. Um, um, a person sells heroin to someone else. Let's make this emotional, sells it to a 12 year old, 13 year old. The money that that person has now collected cannot be given to charity. If you steal from the rich, you cannot give that to the poor and say, oh, I've done a Kedusha thing. Once something comes out of the Tumor box, it remains in the Tumor box and it can't be transformed. So the proceeds of crime cannot be used for good. The proceeds of something um, spiritually bad cannot be converted into something spiritually good. You cannot, virtually, there is only one exception to this whole rule. So basically you cannot um, take something that has been consecrated to idolatry and then use it for sacrifice, which is why we read in the Torah how many times people had to just destroy things that they came in touch with because it had been used for something that could not possibly be changed. The only time that something that has been used for something negative can be changed to something positive is if the person didn't know that what they were doing was negative. And this is where we fit in. We're not educated. As in, anyone alive is not educated like the people who lived in the times of the first and second temple period, where they witnessed miracles, they witnessed spirituality, it was amazing. We're not alive like that, we don't know. We're born, Tinek um, Shanishba, we don't know. Even the education that I got is a pretty lame education compared to what they got a couple thousand years ago, where people just, there was unbelievable knowledge of spirituality and the way of life. So therefore, every time I do something wrong, I don't even know I'm doing something wrong. That's not an excuse. But let's say I do something wrong I didn't know was something wrong, and then the next day I learn, oh my God, I didn't realize not kosher was bad. What am I going to do? You don't stick your two fingers down your throat. You, you continue living with the energy. But now the energy that after making that discovery, what you dedicate your life to changes all your past and brings it over to the positive. So that's the only time, that's our beauty, that us, the uneducated, as we become educated, we're able to do things that we accidentally put in this box and we can put them back into this box. So that's really, really quite cool. So, and that can only be done with the body. Right, made that connection. So, tie it up. Tie it up to last week, Menachem, go on. So can I sell my soul to the devil after all said and done? That is what I want to know. Can I or can't I? And if you're still asking that question, you've, you should buy the recording of last week because there is no devil. There are demons and there's Satan. Proverbially, people sell their souls to Satan, to the devil. You can't. You can't sell this spiritual energy. Let's even forget the devil. A... Sotan is not a devil. He'd never ask you to do something wrong. He'll test you to try to get you, but doesn't want you to succeed. And the Shadim, they can never own your soul because your soul... Let me just go back a slide. This isn't just about two boxes. If everything starts here, guess where souls come from? Souls follow the blue line. Notice how this is a, um, um, a, uh, an offshoot. This is the negativity. This is, you yeah, throw it... I'll allow it to exist by throwing it to the dogs. That's why this is Yamin, it's right, and that's left, which means absolute center is always going to be right. So we, are, we come from the right. We being the human soul came from a very positive space. We, we, we are born, our very, very spiritual essence is to do what's right. To do things that are wrong is impossible for the soul. The body can do it, but the soul can't. So you can never sell your soul to the devil because if the devil is on that side, you can't sell what belongs here and is anchored here because its very essence is here. You can't change that. So you can't sell your soul to the devil. It's impossible. You can do deals and try to lock yourself in, but you can't. Number two, there is no devil to sell your soul to. So a shed, what we see from the Talmud last week, the Shadim never said, come over to our side. 
No, that's not what they do. They just try to create a reality for you in which you deny, where you can no longer see what is spiritually correct, and therefore you just start behaving like they do, or in, in, a, in, a, in a way that will reject spiritual existence and um, reject spiritual positive outcome in this world. You're not coming over to their side. They're just getting you to live a life of denial. So you can't so sell your soul to the devil. Can I become an angel? Well, based on this week, absolutely not. And you shouldn't want to become an angel and you should never label someone an angel because that is so like slotting them into something. Being an angel is so not cool because we're so much greater. An angel can't do anything. They're pre-programmed. They, there is no fulfillment in their existence, nor do they even understand fulfillment, nor does Hashem, even the Creator, get any fulfillment out of them. Rather, I'm so much more than an angel. Because when I succeed, I did so on my own. An angel did so because it was programmed to. So who is better? This is the difference between photography and, uh, and drawings and paintings. That the whole art of, art of painting is that you don't want it to be a photo. You want to you wanna live the, the scene through other uh, uh, mediums, texture, style. Uh, abstract art and modern art, for, let's leave out of this discussion. Let's just stick with impressionists and stuff that we can relate to. A photo, though, is just, well, what's so good about a photo? The only time a photo becomes good, the only photos that make money are the ones that have an artistic angle where suddenly you've blurred something. No longer are you just looking at life. This is a photo. What we see is a photo that is not even worth a, a, a penny because we can all see it. If someone painted this, it would be amazing. So angels are like our vision. There's nothing to it. What we do is we take the paintbrush and we paint, and people pay big bucks for that. We would prefer the child's painting hanging on our fridge than a photocopy of Van Gogh. That's, that's, that's how a lot of people are. Even though you say, but the photocopy is so much better. But who wants a photocopy? I want the child's effort. How much more so I want the accomplished artist's effort rather than just a Kodak snap. You put a bit of art and flair and black and white or an angle or capture an exact moment, that's already an art form and therefore it's no longer a photograph. Do I have free choice? Well, the outcome is yes. By nature of having a soul in a body, you have to have free choice because we have to be able to constantly live down here completely blind of all this, hoping that what I said tonight is right and read the texts and study and meditate and start climbing up the, route, the rungs where things start making sense. But down here, yes, we're constantly choosing between the two. Every decision will, will, will go one way or the other. So free choice is very much part of us, but it only happens in a body, in a world that is completely abstract from the spiritual. Do angels, demons make a difference to my life? The answer is yes and the answer is no. The answer is, no, they make no difference. Don't rely on them. Don't think about them. But the fact is, they're in this room. Constantly, every time a person has a refuah, every time a person is healed from a sickness, how do you know that wasn't Hashem saying, this person's life, this person's time has not come. Raphael, go and cure them. Raphael, go plant the cure for a disease so that science can discover it. Because we say, who are the angels of this world? The doctors. This is what the Talmud says, that doctors are angels. Because their whole mission in this world is to do refuah, is to do healing. So this is a miracle. The miracle of healing is an unbelievable discovery that man has made. And, and where, what is it that one day there wasn't a cure and the next day there is a cure? What changed in the world? Nothing besides the ability to get this higher. All of a sudden we were able to see it. The discovery had been made. Why couldn't they discover it yesterday? Why did it have to take so long? Because that was the moment. And that's the moment that Raphael is charged with the job. Make it clear. What, so, so angels are constantly affecting our lives because God is using the angels because God can't get involved in our lives. Hashem can't get involved in our lives because El Akut is up there. It's so abstract. We're down here. The two can't mix or else you get a cosmic explosion. It'd be like putting atomic energy into a jar. It doesn't, doesn't work. 
You've got to work with, with, with um, small, small breakdowns. An angel is just like the soul is, this small breakdown. Like the extension cord, so is the, the angel. So yes, they do make differences, but don't tap into them. In fact, you're not even meant to rely on an angel. It gets extremely dangerous. If you rely on an angel, you could be believing a shit off in some sort of godly partnership. However, we do say, we do say um, um, there is a prayer before going to sleep. Um, that on my hand, Mimni Michael is the angel Michael. Miss Mali Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. And basically, it's not that I'm asking the angels to surround me and give me, but rather that all my decisions be, be that everything I do, when I go to sleep, I'm asking the angels to surround me so that as my right functions, that angel will help dominate to ensure that my soul passes this way, that my left dominate. Uriel is the angel of enlightenment, that I should always have that force Uriel making sure that push me so that I'm operating in the correct way. It's not that I'm asking them to be my go-betweens, but rather that the forces of these angels always be with me. I'm asking Hashem, basically, if I'm about to do something wrong, please send one of your angels to help me make the right decision or do the right thing. And where to from here? Well, from here, it's getting late. Time to go home. <laughs> so, where to? We've learnt a lot. We now know that the body is only a chariot. When I get hungry, that's not the be-all and end-all. That is my body saying I need sustenance. The question is, why should I sustain myself? That then calls for high understanding. We've learned about the soul, which is the whole purpose that our body lives. Come with me, little Nishamala. The soul has been promised that it will be given a life of potential. The question is, do we allow our soul to live a life of potential? So from here is going home and living life exactly the way it was before, but just watching, watching the way we live life. Is this working out? Is this the right way? Am I? And hang on, is that niggling feeling inside actually not, not actually an irregular heartbeat? Is it perhaps something much, much deeper that I want something more in life and I'm not giving in to myself? Maybe I need to just get out of what I'm doing and not be reckless and just think about what is it that I want to do? And there's, I, I conclude last week to someone um, yesh mazal Yisrael, ain mazal Yisrael. There's a famous um, argument in the Talmud. Do we have mazal or not? And uh, the conclusion is that we do have mazal. Mazal is luck. Mazal is uh, spiritual forces. When you wish someone mazal tov, you're wishing them good energy. You should have good energy about you. You should have luck. There's no such thing as luck because everything's perfect. Everything's precise. But we're asking that your precision be one of positive. That you sh everything should be well with your child. You should, you should have all the right energy in raising your child. Muzzle is, 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 it's not an angel, but it's whatever, it's energy. So, um, why did I say that? <laughs> why did I bring up muzzle? Come on, this is part of my closer. Yeah, oh, that's right. So we should we should ha we should have that right muzzle and and yeah. So we know how that's right. The body and soul. We should we now know our soul. We should have the right muzzle to be in touch with our soul. Everything that we covered last week. Ah, oh, ain muzzle is soul. Yesh muzzle is soul. So if you say there is muzzle, then you're opening yourself up to muzzleus. Muzzle is energy, but then you're opening yourself up to energy fields dominating your life. And energy fields are manipulated by different forces, angels and demons. So if I, sh if I don't believe in any of that, none of that affects me, according to the Talmud. If you don't believe in any mazolus, it doesn't affect you. Which is why I read one interesting article, why we don't see miracles, because we've shut ourselves off from that. We don't see miracles because we don't allow miracles into our life. We don't want to see it. And therefore, we don't see it. I really do want to see it. I buy lottery tickets every week. Yes, but if you really wanted it, you'd also. There's so much more that goes with it, with the belief of it, and the opening up and being uh, receptible and susceptible to it. Also, is a complete change. And spiritualists see miracles. Non-spiritualists don't see miracles. If you say ain't muzzle, so there, there is no muzzle. You're right. You're not going to see it. There won't be any angels. There won't be any demons. You open yourself up to it, and you start seeing things. And it's not that you're seeing things like the person I was talking about who heard voices. You're really seeing things. It's like the, the physicist who walks around after doing uh, a million PhDs in physics and making all the discoveries, and then not only make the discovery, but now walking around with two microscopes on their eyes. 
They will never see the world the same way as we do. They just see atoms and they're blown away by everything that happens. There are no chairs in the room. It's just different forms of matter and they get so excited. That's what the yesh mazel. If you believe it, you're going to see it, but then you're not going to see the world the same way as the naive person and you're actually going to live a much higher existence and actually be a lot more in touch and a lot more conscious. So that's where to from here. Decide whether you want to be into the muzzle or you're not into the muzzle and then you'll start either seeing things or continuing the way you are, uh, the way one is. Um, and that's my conclusion.